Is it raining or anything up there, Joel? Is it cold? It has been raining, yes. It It's funny. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to keep raining all week or turn into snow. That's kind of where we're at, temperature-wise. But today it was rain. Blowing a gale here in Texas. We don't... Um, we don't get too much craziness here besides snow. Although we have had a few occasions where rain like this turns into freezing rain and ice and Dude, that's you know, nasty stuff. Impassable roads, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're up in Buffalo, right? Rochester, same diff. Well, not quite. They get a lot more snow than we do. The, the prevailing winds around here are from the west and north, so we get um, we get a little bit of lake effect, you know, they call it, where we get yeah. extra snow because of the lake. But Buffalo has got the lake to the north of them and to the west of them, and so they just get hammered. Oh, you're in that the only place around that gets more snow than that is Watertown. They're way up north. On the east end of uh, Ontario, and so they get crazy amounts of snow. Do you snowmobile or anything like that? Did you get I don't. Snow? Honestly, I grew up in Costa Rica, and snow sports are just not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, and you live up there. You should be living in yeah, Texas. Well, I like North. winter. I, I have to say I like winter, but I have not um I didn't grow up, you know, skiing or any of these kinds of activities. And so I never really picked them up as an adult. I keep wishing my kids are getting to the age where I should have taught them, and I feel bad that I can't. And so I keep thinking I should like just take them skiing even though i don't like it huh. but my <laughs> wife doesn't like it either and so that makes it double hard. <laughs> that makes it easy man hey you guys waiting on me oliver or no we were waiting on nick we can't find him <laughs> Well, let me see if I wonder if I got a cell number. Yeah. Just make him join this uh, this, this hangouts to the cell. I don't have his contact with you. Oh wait, you have that, huh? That is fun stuff. Have you seen Binder? No. Not I don't know who pays for this thing. I don't know who pays for this thing, but it's crazy. Oliver, I just texted him, dude. Okay. I need to publish this image. Maybe tonight after the presentation, I'll do it. All right, he's on his way. Hey, sorry about that, guys. No hey, Nick. I was on the phone with the help desk. Are you in? Did you get that email? They said that they changed your password. I'm not in. Huh. <laughs> All right. The new password is. Quick, so everybody can see it. <laughs> Got it. Hopefully, you see if that works. You're on? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, thank you.
Cool. Oh, should I go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize we were. <laughs> well, I could. What's up, Tom? Yeah, we're on. You're on, dude. Go ahead. All right. My, my apologies. Um, so, yeah, tech systems. Uh, we can help you guys with the resume, help you find new jobs. Um, I don't want to you know, waste you guys' time to talk about the open positions we have right now. Um, there are a lot. So they're not necessarily going to line up with what you want to do, what you like doing. So if you are looking for a new job, um, just come contact me. I'll put you in contact with one of my partners. Um, and we just want to figure out what you want to do, what you're looking for, what you're looking to make. And that way we'll reduce that position over up and give you a call and say, hey, is this what you were talking about? Check this out. You want to get an interview? Top that and then I'll go. Um, so we just want to keep it really simple. Come on in. If you're, how you doing? Grab a seat one there. Um, if you guys are just looking for updates on local market trends, uh, about what companies are hiring, what skill sets, um, what companies are moving here, uh, we can definitely fill you in on all that as well. So um, appreciate you guys' time, and, and you guys are welcome always here. So I'll kick it on back to Tom. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, April PowerShell for Arizona. And I'm pleased to announce that we have uh, Joel Bennett. Um, as our speaker for this evening. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Joel so we can start if he'd like. Um, and I'll be fine. All right. Thanks for joining, Joel. And we appreciate it. You're welcome. You guys can all hear me okay, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I want to talk to you today about literate DevOps. And um, I'll show you some tools, and we'll see where we go from there. This presentation is not very long, so at the end, we'll just do whatever we need to do. I've got lots of, um, well, I used to do these kinds of presentations and play stump the scripter, so if we have too much free time, we'll do that. Um, but anyway, so I want to talk to you about literate DevOps, but let me introduce myself first. Um, so who am I? Um, I've been a hacker and a programmer since, you know, I bought my first Atari 800 XL. Um, some of you can identify with that. Um, but I have been um, hacking and programming everything that I could get my hands on since then. However, I actually went to college my, the first time I went to college. Um, I actually got a major in social sciences and youth ministry. <laughs> and that colors a lot of how I see the world and how I react to things. Um, when I graduated, instead of <laughs> instead of getting a job as a – well, actually, my, my original plan was I was going overseas. I was going to become a youth pastor in England or Europe. Um, and, I, and I made it over there, but I didn't stay. I came back. I took a job at Xerox doing test automation for them um, and did that for years. Eventually became a software engineer in their um, – uh, well, their .NET uh, development group. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. I've been doing DevOps and uh, worked at Splunk for a while. Worked at, um, well, let's just leave it at. I worked at Xerox and I worked at Splunk and a lot of little consulting gigs in between. Uh, I'm currently at question mark, um, as in question mark.com. Um <laughs> And I work full time there, uh, managing. Well, we're, we're we are moving the their whole hosted environment to Azure. Um, so that's who I am. I'm also a Microsoft PowerShell MVP. So, in other words, <laughs> I just wish we'd stop taking the learning curve for granted. So, in, as as part of my never-ending quest to essentially help people onboard easier. Um, one of the things that I see a lot of problems with is everywhere I go, I, I, I remember when I first started in the web development team at Xerox, the manager there, you know, gave, <laughs> I still, it still makes me laugh. They gave, they sat me down at a workstation and they said, all right, well, here's the TFS repo, you know, check things uh do a checkout and um, just look around for a bit. And here's your first bug. Fix it. And I downloaded 
their code and downloaded and downloaded and downloaded. And I said, holy cow, how am I supposed to fix anything in here? And he said, well, that's what we wanted you to realize. So go ask this guy. He knows the area really well, and he'll tell you where to find the code that probably has that bug in it. And, you know, we don't expect you to be productive for a year or so, they said. Yeah. Um, so this is crazy, right? I mean, this is just absolutely bonkers. We can't as, as I mean, Xerox as a company couldn't, but we as an engineering profession can't allow that kind of a gap between when we hire you and when you're useful, right? Um, so... Literate programming is the I, I'm talking about literate DevOps, right? But the forefather of literate DevOps is literate programming. And um, oddly enough, it was actually written. There was a book called Literate Programming written by Donald Knuth, which hopefully that's a name you'll recognize. But he wrote this book in 1984. Um, and the goal, um, I mean, his, his intro says, I believe the time is ripe for significantly better documentation of programs and that we can best achieve this by considering programs to be works of literature. Um, but that was his, his goal. He says, what we want to do is we want to change our attitude from, you know, imagining that our main task is to tell a computer what to do and instead concentrate on explaining to humans what we want the computer to do. Um, so we're going to write as an essayist, we're going to use, we're going to be really careful about what variable names we do. We're going to, um, you know, use a thesaurus and, and, um, have excellent style and make sure that the, the document that we write is ordered in such a way that humans can understand it instead of being ordered in the way that makes sense for the computer. Um, and so they actually wrote a whole bunch of these tools. Um, Tangle, they, they had the, these two main tools, Tangle and Weave, but they had written them for a whole bunch of different languages because they had one for Fortran and one for C and so on. Um, and the idea was that you would literally write a document and embedded in the document would be these little keywords and then blocks of code. Um, and anywhere you wanted, you could just sort of put uh, curly braces and uh, not curly braces, angle brackets is what they used. Um, and you would say this, uh, you know, this file is or this named block. It's, it's defined somewhere else. So you, they actually had like meta programming, if you will, they were they were breaking apart their for loops and taking bits of the code and putting them elsewhere so that they could explain things in an order that made sense when they were trying to explain them to a human being, right? Um, now, the problem is all the examples that you're gonna find of these literate programming apps, they're demos, they're parts of a book. They like, you know, they rewrote some other program like, like word count, W count. Um, they rewrote it um, as a demo of what it could have looked like if it had been written um, literate programming. Uh, needless to say, never really took off. Um, there, it was not a huge success, but computer scientists continue experimenting with it and continue experimenting with it. So why bring it up? Well, <laughs> To quote Newth, I think the time is ripe for better documentation. Um, we have a lot of new tools available to us now. We have a lot of new audiences available to us now. And one of those, of course, are our DevOps people. Um, suddenly, we're bringing all these people that used to just, you know, build things, literally, you know, infrastructure and so on. And we're asking them to do it as code. Um, and... As we bring those in, we've got a lot of new tools. We've got, um, well, I've got a list here. I'm, I'm going to literally like, um, this list is the Google list. Just search for each of those terms. You'll find all sorts of fun and neat tools, projects, plugins, etc. cetera. Um, Interact is a, uh, well, we'll get, well, I'll talk a little bit about these later. Um, so what is literate DevOps. 
Um, there's a couple of guys, Howard Abrams and Mark Hoffman, who've been doing presentations about literate DevOps the last few years. And they, uh, they like to say DevOps is bimodal. You're, you're either banging your head until the server works or you're trying to capture what you did into some kind of automation tool like, you know, um, your your build tools or you're, you're trying to capture it into Puppet or Chef um, or, <laughs> or an Azure resource management template or something. Um, and so what we want is we want to make number one more like number two. We want the effort that we put in as we're trying to make things work. Yes, exactly. We would like to bang our head on the keyboard and capture that effort as automation. Um, so how do we do that? Um, that's funny that like double skipped. Woo. We're going in all directions. That is fun. I haven't used this tool before. Um, so essentially what we want to do is capture the process of investigating right so that other people can learn from our bruises so that we can export it to automation tools so that we basically don't have to repeat it again um and for me i mean i don't know about you guys in my company i'm the senior right so other people come to me all the time how do i do this a lot of times i get like an email and i spend a few minutes fiddling and i go okay here you go and they're like, what the heck? How did you figure that out? And then I got to go, uh, I don't know. I mean, it was obvious, <laughs> right? Uh, I just, I don't know. I mean, I went on the server and I ran this command, but I can't remember what the command was. Um, and I saw a value in the output that made me realize what the problem was. Um, and so how do we, how do we fix that? How do we, I want, I want at work, I want to do that same thing, but I want to do it in a way that when I'm done, I can give those guys the export of how I figured it out without having to go back and re-figure it out again. You know, I've, I, cause I've done that, right. Figured it out. And then I've gone back and tried to replicate my steps doing get history in my PowerShell console to see what I wrote and try to figure out what steps it was that clued me in so that I can document the process um i want to do that as i go so my current tool of choice for that are jupyter notebooks um and i'm going to show you them in a minute um these little slides were were almost at the end of or just sort of to give me um well to help me get an explanation on paper so that i don't forget what i needed to say but um jupyter notebooks is a web-based app um and what it gives us is a way to intermix markdown and code that actually gets executed. Um, there are other tools. There are lots of other tools that do this. Um, most of those ones, you know, if we go back here, uh, these tools that I mentioned here, right? Jupyter Emacs org mode is the same thing. You get a text document and you put a couple of comments and you say, this is bash code. You type some bash code. Um, then you write some more comments and then you write, okay, this is, you know, C code and you write some C code, whatever. Um, Interact is a desktop app that basically is exactly the same as Jupyter. Spider is an, uh, an IDE um, for Python that actually um, hosts Jupyter documents. Adam, you guys all know Adam, the text editor that, that GitHub makes, right? Um, it's not Visual Studio Code. It's the other. Um, it's the other one. And um, they have a plugin called Hydrogen that lets you literally do the exact same kind of thing as Emacs org mode. Um, in fact, the Hydrogen plugin is actually written by the Interact folks. Um, but it basically lets you do the same thing as Emacs org mode, where you write Markdown and then you uh embed code in the middle um apache zeppelin and jupiter labs are um much bigger i think i can demo jupiter lab for you um you'll see what i mean by much bigger um so let's go back where was i um oh yeah i was gonna say so we have two options right um 
it's kind of weird that this is refusing to do there's there are actually two additional points here and they're not showing up anyway so we have we have um we have two options when we're trying to do this right we want we want to capture this we have two options one is we write down everything we do and the other is we do a like start transcript and we just log it all and we hope that that's enough later um i tried to start transcript method and i have found that um what i really end up needing is some way of like circling stuff in the transcript as i go because otherwise when you're looking at the transcript later you can't remember what it was that triggered the next step um so i'm moving to this notebooks concept now remember this isn't literate development this isn't liter the literate programming concept this is an application code this is deployments this is infrastructure this is troubleshooting that's what i'm documenting um so i'm not gonna write some essay about my plans and like what donald newth was imagining um i'm simply taking notes during my investigation so i need a good tool for that um i want a notebook i like markdown so i'd rather write in markdown than deal with um you know learning hotkeys for control b for bold and all that kind of thing um, but i want the code in line and i don't want to have to like pull the code out in order to rerun it later so this is where we ended up with jupiter now um i will show you here uh ooh. i think i will show you here this um this is jupiter running on my local box hopefully kind of odd there we go uh, so this is jupiter lab now the difference between jupiter lab and jupiter notebook is really really minor and basically um jupiter lab is like gen gen 2 um it's tabbed and it has generic text editing capabilities so one of the things i really like about jupiter lab for instance let me let me show you this right i can open this readme document it's just a markdown doc because this is for github's readme right <coughs> um but i can right click here and i can do show markdown preview and it's just like you know um it's just like doing it in visual studio code i've got you know i've got code i've got a preview if i um i've got live preview editing so as i make changes on the left they show up on the right right you see 22 um that is not true i wish i was handling 22. um the um other thing is obviously the the notebook so if i go to uh well actually i was going to do a new one that there, there are python um they have a console mode here so i'll show you that with python uh oh i won't show you that with python i don't know why i can't show you that with powershell because the powershell kernel that i'm going to show you is one that i'm working on and the console mode in the powershell kernel doesn't work yet because I haven't implemented history and apparently that's mandatory um but you can actually kick out a terminal here which is just it's different than a console because it's not using the um it's not using the actual notebook engine um but you can kick out a terminal here which i think i can kick out a terminal here uh or not why not Maybe it's like restart. My click isn't. It's well. It's like I'm I'm clicking and it's not. Yeah, restart your session. Maybe your session tokens change. <laughs> well, so we that's yeah. possible. Um, I did actually. Um. I'm just looking at the debugging window over here. It's still running. So, all right. Well, I'm not going to worry too much about the console. I don't really care about the console. The point that I'm trying to show you is um, I can do something like this. So I have um, a release document here, which is how I did the last release for this project. Um, this here at the top, 
uh, is just because I want to make sure that um, I've got the right, I'm in the right folder um, when I run this as a, as a script. Um, but you see, I'm, I've got markdown blocks right here in the middle, right? So this, uh, this code, if I just double click it, if I just double click it, if I just, why is that not? That is just odd. <laughs> um, they hijacked, by the way, did you see that? They, they hijacked the right click menu. Um, I love that. Um, it's very well done. The only problem is for right now, double clicking is not working to open the editor. So I can add new, oh, cheapers. I can add new cells. Anyway, so you can go to Markdown and you can type, you know, and they, and they give you syntax highlighting. So headlines, right? Um, and you can do all your like italics and, and bold um and then when you control enter you get the rendered version um and i don't know why this one is like locked and i can't edit it um anyhow um it's just that one i must have locked it on i forgot about that there is a there's a setting in in jupiter notebooks there's a setting that you can lock a node and you can unlock it and in here i actually don't know how to unlock them um, because labs is, is not quite the same as notebook, but it still respects the lock apparently. Um, so anyway, you see here that what I have is literally like the steps that I do to do a release. I'm deleting the old release folder. I'm calling .net store. And what you see in the output here, right? So this is input. This is the command I ran. This is the output. This is the output from the last time I ran this. Um, and if I needed to explain, like if this this is just my release process, so I've explained why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, and I'm doing it, and then down here I'm saying, okay, so I'm trying to com collect. The reason why I'm doing all this moving around is I'm trying to collect output from multiple .NET framework builds because .NET 4.6.2 for you know Windows PowerShell and .NET Core app for PowerShell 6, you know PowerShell Core. Um, I'm moving it all together and. Um, so the point that I'm trying to get at, of course, is not the process that I went to. I'm just trying to show you this is how I'm using um, Jupyter. I'm able to write my documentation, and I can come in here anytime and um, modify this. And like, like if I look at it and I go, oh, man, I can't believe I didn't explain whatever. Like I just added this today, the name of the cat file, because I saw down here that I had called this Jupyter PowerShell cat. And I wanted to be clear that the name of that thing isn't magic. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, it is, however, important that you don't change it after you create it. Because the tool that um, this new file catalog command that, that PowerShell gives you is a matching command to check the file catalog. And, um, and if you rename anything after you make the catalog, then the catalog is invalid, right? Um, so anyway, so this is basically Jupyter Lab. Now, um, you know, the cool thing that I'm that I've got is I've got I've written this PowerShell kernel so we can run PowerShell code in it. Um, the other thing that I was going to show you is um, if you look here, um, if I bring up, I think this one. Do, do, do. So you can see, oh, why is that not filled in? I'm not going to wait. Um, but you can see here, do you see that um, this is running on my Windows box, right? Um, but I can do remote sessions. Now, I don't have a Linux box handy at the moment. I can do remote sessions. So you see this is an, uh, a previous remote session. And I can then invoke command into those remote sessions. So even my remote debugging, I'm able to do inside here. Um, I'm <laughs> this show plotly thing I was playing. This the reason why this file is called untitled is because it's not checked into source control, or it's not meant to be checked into source control. Um, and it's where I messed around with 
things. I'm playing with trying to do some um, graphing output, and it's not working yet. Um, but you can do, right? You can run your get module commands. You can check your environment variables. You can do anything you can do in PowerShell. Um, and the only difference is, you know, that you're, you're capturing the output streaming from the server. Now, the other cool thing about this is that this, uh, although in this particular case, I'm running Jupyter locally, right? Localhost 888. Jupyter itself could be running anywhere. Um, and it supports authentication and various types of things like that. So I could, for instance, put this on a, a jump server on our deployment um, so that I would be able to use Jupyter as my way of remoting into the management box. Um, that'd be cool because then I'd have everything that anybody did would have to be done through this thing and we'd have the logging and captured output and everything, you know, in a way that we could repro. Um, now, one of the other things that's really cool about Jupyter is if I have this release thing and I've documented it and it's great, but um, I want to run this in automation now, right? So uh, Jupyter has the ability, if you do this, you see save notebook as or export notebook as, and you can actually do an export and you can export it as the executable script or as a PDF, HTML, uh, Markdown, whatever. But the, the executable script actually gives you, I'm thinking that's going to have opened, no, not yet. What is it? Why is it taking so long? There we go. Um, and watch this not work right. Okay, that was beautiful. Here we go. Um, come on. Can you guys see that? It's kind of dark. Uh, Small. Yeah, hang on. Uh, oh dear, it didn't go white when I did that, but it's bigger. Can you see that? Is that big enough? Yeah. Um, so you can see that this literally just pulled all the code out of that script, out of that notebook and created a PowerShell script for me called release PS1. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I want to go to automation, I don't necessarily have to deploy all that uh, documentation as, as comments in my script. I just dump the script out and off we go. Um, I am a big fan of that um, because I don't really, uh, although I want to write all this documentation as I'm exploring, as far as like what's going into um, like an ARM template or something, I don't I don't need to send all this extra stuff. And then the other thing is one of the stuff that like you can do in here as an example. I, I think I can demo this. Um, so um, pictures. Uh, so if we do like this. Um, Oop, and that did not work because why? Nope, that's weird. That should work, honest. It's locked. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I can edit. Um, this is one of those like, I'm just not gonna worry about it. Um, I could, I could open this in. Uh, so the other the other neat uh, neat app I want to show you is this um, this thing is called Interact, and this is basically just a um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I can't I can't remember the name of this stupid thing. The engine that they use to write Atom and VS Code and all the other portable. Um, apps based on chromium and and node.js um these guys rewrote jupiter in node.js so there's an there's a windows installer for this thing it installs interact installs on your computer as an application and it's associated with notebooks so then when you come in here and you go to like uh powershell you see all the notebooks have an icon 
So uh, we were looking at release. I can double click release and eventually it's not the fastest thing in the world. And my computer right now is not happy with me. I don't know what it is. Um, but it opened on the other screen, which is a shame because it has a really cool splash screen that you would have been able to see. Um, so there it is, right? So what I like about Interact is that ability to double click a dock and open it. Um, but also it's, it's integrated pretty well. Um, if I go here and do that same thing that I showed you or that I tried to do in the other one and failed, I can guarantee you it'll work here. Um, so I drag this in here. And no, denied. Why not? I'm starting to think it's the picture. I don't know. I give up. That's so strange. I don't know. Electron. Yes, that is the name. Yes. Well, anyway, you can honestly edit. You can actually insert drag and drop pictures, and I don't know why it's not working. It worked earlier. I even have in the README, there are actually pictures I, that I did as a demo. See picture. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> By the way, the README here is actually probably a better demo. You see I have um, some of the features demoed. Like, Just as a note, you can run commands and store stuff in variables and then output them later. The variables stick around. You do have to be careful, though, because um, these things can be rerun. <laughs> so, um, for instance, if down here there was a set location command, and then I went back up here and reran this one. I'd get different output, right? Um, because I'm changing it. Um, but I also have in the in the PowerShell kernel, I have not done a whole lot of uh, extensions. But what I have done is a command called write Jupyter, which allows you to output HTML or Markdown, um, even using like. PowerShell's built-in convert to. So you can do files, convert to, and select your list, and then write Jupyter, I'm type HTML, because I've converted it to HTML already, right? And then you get your table, and you can see there's a little bit of like hover and all this kind of stuff. Um, I have a demo not in here, apparently. I have a demo where um, I did a convert to. Now, you see I'm using dash fragment. If you're not familiar with convert to HTML, convert to HTML puts the header and everything on there. But if you say fragment, it just outputs the table tags, um, which is obviously what I want. Um, there's a way in convert to HTML that you can specify um, pre and post um, tags. So you can inject a, a JavaScript to do the table sorting. So I have an example of that somewhere. Um, now, the other thing that's interesting is um, the right Jupyter will look, it will try to sniff what kind of MIME type it is. So in this case, we've got an object, it's a hash table, that has a property HTML, right? Now, in this case, it's actually a hash table with a key HTML, but you know PowerShell, hash tables with keys, objects with properties, eh, who cares? Same difference. So when you have any object that has an HTML property and you pipe it to write Jupyter, it just comes out as HTML. Um, you can do the same thing with images. So you see here I've embedded, I've created an object with a image tag in it and I did write Jupyter, I get an image out. Um, if I do this, well, this is more interesting, right? So I've captured, I've done an invoke web request and I've actually captured the raw bytes from the web request to pull down a PNG. And you can do write Jupyter and you can say it's an image PNG. And here's the bytes. You can just render those bytes. Now those bytes, if you go and look at the actual document, I don't know if you if you've seen Jupyter before, you probably know this. If you haven't, um I want Apparently, I need to exit. Um, release, uh, 
No, I want read me, read me. Uh, that one. So these things are just JSON documents, okay? So one of the things I mentioned earlier, the capturing output using transcripts. One of the things I'm working on is a script that'll take a transcript and turn it into this by sniffing the command versus output and just rendering it as JSON. Um, but what's cool about actually doing it in the kernel, um, you see this here, all this, this is a PNG in MIME format. And it's embedded in the document, right? So this thing, even when I move this document somewhere else, I don't need the image anymore. I've dumped it all inside the um, inside the document. Um, but the other thing you can do, I'm trying. I'm looking if I have the example to show you here. See this thing here? Um, see, how there's all these properties in here. This this is the raw JSON for a document. Or I mean for a file. And so what where you see that in here is nowhere. Um, and the reason is because it's not visible. Um, but you can, when you dump uh, with with right Jupiter, you can dump and store like CLI XML or JSON in the document so that you can read them out later. Um, that gives you a way of doing uh, collections of objects that you so you see this here this is where that json is um and it just it in the document it just renders as well there was some stuff right so, um but uh in reality the full json is there and we would be able to read that document out um or read those objects back in to deserialize them from json um anyway so this is basically what um what jupiter does and why i think that it's very cool um i find that documenting and you see like i'm just putting little comments in here as i go um when i'm debugging something at work i'm able to just sort of fly as i'm just typing an output type and output um and then when i make a oh i'm like oh i can see that i just write it out in markdown oh in the output above, I saw that this was the property of that, and now I'm going to experiment and see why. Um, so, yeah. And now, by the way, one of the cool things about this, of course, it works cross platform. So, over here, um, I've got hubmybinder.org. Mybinder.org is a website that you can point at a GitHub repo, and they will pick up a Docker file that's lying around in that GitHub repo and run it and host the Jupyter project from it. So binder is actually run by Jupyter. So it's, you can't just run random anything, um, but they will host the Jupyter thing. So you can see over here, I got the same readme. Um, this of course is, ooh, I may have left it idle too long. Binder turns your yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Binder turns your website off um, if you don't hit it frequently enough. And then you have to go back out and find the version where it's out the token on the end. Um, it'll only take a minute to rebuild it because there. So you see the the URL there, gh for GitHub, Jekyll Jupiter PowerShell. That Jekyll is my username. Jupiter PowerShell is the project master is the branch and they're literally going to go and run the docker thing they found that they had a cached version so they're just launching that um earlier you saw the output they were actually running the whole docker container and that docker container by the way is doing a full build from source code of the project um but anyway so um that is basically i um yeah, that's basically what I want to show you. I I have um, there are some other tools which are very cool. Um, this was one. So Beaker X, um, these guys have created a a Jupiter kernel that um, does interactive time series stuff. So they've actually taken um, we've combined 
a series of JVM languages. So Groovy, Scala, Clojure, Kotlin, Java, etc. Um, and they've added a bunch of what Jupyter calls magics, which are um, little, um, I don't know what to call them other than magics. Um, uh, like widgets, that's the word. So you see this table, they've got a table widget. Um, it automatically recognizes uh, data frames from their thing. So this is the stuff that I want to add to the PowerShell one. Like, oh, I see CSV, let's render a, a, a table. Um, I see um, that you've done a SQL, you, that you've output a SQL data object, right? Um, or a, a SQL data set. Um, let me just render that as a table. Um, but this is where I would like to be and not where I am. Um, happy to take pull requests, by the way. Um, <laughs> the uh, the beaker thing is cool because what they have done is they've combined multiple languages, and so you can actually do um, one Jupyter document with with like mix a mix of Python and Scala and Clojure and JavaScript all in one uh, document. Uh, that's what Intract is working towards as well. Um, but currently the ways that they're doing it is not, doesn't let it play well with new kernels. So I give them my PowerShell kernel and they're like, oh, but now you need to do all this extra work to get it to play with our stuff. Um, so that's where, um, but these guys, th these guys are uh, another company that's doing this, uh, the interact, uh, project. Those guys are just some, like the, the main developer for interact works at um netflix i think um but yeah questions i think um so again you're using you're using this to help you with uh support of yeah i mean so i'm thing. using it uh, yeah i i'm using it um, when I get a question from a teammate, I'm trying to remember. So I'm still at the point where this is new to me, right? Um, I'm trying to remember to go and create a new document. Now, long term, um, I believe that once I've convinced my team of the value of this, we will set up a server. And so these, these notebooks will be shared on a server somewhere, right? Um, we'll probably just run it in Azure, um, or, or, or on binder. Um, but, um, we'll probably just, uh, set up a server so that we can have the shared notebooks. Um, and everybody will be able to pull up an, uh, an interface like this. You know, we already have a, um, currently what we use for this is OneNote. Um, so we have a shared OneNote notebook. Um, it it kind of serves the same purpose as this for us, except that, of course, nothing in there is executable. So I routinely have to go into OneNote and copy-paste code out of OneNote and into a console to reproduce the fix that we figured out last time, right? Um, but then you do that actually more than a... It's a little bit hard to see your screen, but um, you can actually highlight that code and actually execute it, right? And then it gives yeah, you the result. Yeah, I don't even have to highlight. I, all you do is click in a cell here and run it. So there's a, a run button here, or if you hit Control Enter, it just reruns the code. Um, and there are actually, if you look up here, do you, sorry, what? Can you cause it to actually uh, not have data in the pane below so you can actually see it show up when yes. it runs? So if you do you see here run selected cells, um, there's okay. all there's run all above selected cell and then there's run selected cell and all below, and then there's run all cells. Um, there is a uh, here all outputs. Now this is gonna screw me up. Oh, cool. So then because the chances are this isn't gonna work. Those, it'll produce the it'll produce the results set for you then. Right. So then if I okay. reran all the 
uh, run all cells in theory, assuming everything's still working, this should slowly repopulate. Um, I don't know what's taking so long. My computer has been grinding all day. Um, I had a, a Teams channel open earlier, and it was um, like doing 70% of my computer just to run a Teams meeting. Um, so I don't know why it's doing that, but I haven't had a chance to reboot. And it's funny. It has saved the document, but it has not rerun it. I don't know why. You see the star there? The star means we've asked the kernel to run this, and it hasn't gotten back to us. Um, and you can see the – well, maybe you can't. That's tiny. You, there's a tooltip here that says kernel connected. So everything is still in order, but I'm not getting any output. I don't know why. We can – here, let's do it over here. Um, so if I open up the readme on the Linux box um, – so the one you're running and you're demonstrating is actually running on your host and not the one off the Yeah, it's running on the laptop. Right. right. Okay. So this one is now running on the mybinder.org. Um, and it should work just as well. So now, by the way, you see this different interface. This is Jupyter Notebook, not Jupyter Lab. Um, so there's some trivial differences but basically we should be able to do cell current outputs clear and no, cell current outputs clear is it me oh it thinks i mean this cell there are no outputs for this cell. where's the all outputs there we go Ah, why? Clear. Um, and then cell run all. So there we go. And you see there's PS version table output. Um, there's the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so in case you haven't heard, in PowerShell 6, sort is not an alias because sort is supposedly a native Linux command. Um, but, of course, it's not available on the VM here, so that sucked. Um, I really need to... Um, whatever. There you go. Um, but you see all the output got refreshed. Oh, and look, there's the happy birthday image that wasn't showing up. The other one, I don't know. Um, so there it is, right? Um, these ones, by the way, these ones on the bottom were literally me. I You see this recent changes. I fixed several bugs, so errors show up. Yay! Um, because before, you just got no output for errors, um, which was not cool. Um, but yeah, so literally, um, it is possible to treat this as like a run book where you just kind of go, okay, I, um, I'm, I'm connected to it. It's, it's on the box. You know, the URL here shows that it's on the box that I care about. And I can just rerun all. Um, and there we go. Boom. And by the way, you can tell it reran it because you see here 14. The number changes. So this started at one because it's the um it was the first command. But when we when we run it again, each time we run it, it increments the history counter. Um the uh now we're up to 26 because we're you know um so yeah, so you can always just you know hit run all and then and re reevaluate the whole document. Um, so, how far have you gone with this, Joel? Have you actually done it with functions as well, or just straight up script? Uh, what do you mean? Well, can you? So you I would assume that you could uh, put the uh, text around like this function is meant to do blah 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 blah. Oh, yeah, Man. yeah. So if I wanted to define a function in here, I could absolutely do that. There's nothing stopping me. Um, but just wouldn't execute till you call it, right? And then the results of that function won't? Right, exactly. Okay. And then is there any notion of debugging in the middle of it? Or you just you just get the output? 
The thing I cannot get used to, by the way, is that shift enter or control enter executes and enter just makes it line. And I keep hitting shift enter to avoid executing it. And instead I execute it, which is kind of really missing the point. So we could do that. And then down here, uh, well, now I need to run this. Um, but then down here, whoop. I literally have no idea what that just said. Um, down here, I would do get files in order. Of now, an interesting fact is that the the Jupiter kernel itself, I mean, the Jupiter itself supports stuff like tab completion, but oh, uh, but my kernel does not. Um, so that's still to do. Uh, one of the things that um, this would be further along, I wrote, I started writing this seven months ago, and I worked on it for a few weeks, and then had to just give up. And the reason was at the time, the PowerShell core simply didn't work. Um, and I wasn't really willing to to go ahead, work, making a bunch of effort to get a Jupyter kernel working because Jupyter is such a cross platform, cross everything uh, project. I didn't want to release a Windows only PowerShell kernel. Um, and now, um, a month ago, they finally made a new release of the PowerShell 6 SDK, and it works correctly on Linux, as you can see. Um, so now if I run that, you see, there you go. So there's my function, and I called it. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely do that. And of course, now I could come here, and I could say, uh, insert cell above, and I can say this is markdown, um, and I can write... This function is storing the files in files because I want to be able to use You can even do markdown. Um, and what I should do, of course, in order to make everything else continue working, I need to make this global files. Because otherwise, all the other scripts are going to stop working now that I um, Oops. Because this, you know, these this code down here, they're all using that dollar files. Um, yeah, makes sense. Um, I, I can do essentially anything that I could do in a PowerShell console. Um, and I have IntelliSense uh, coming, but I do have syntax highlighting and everything else works. Um, you can even turn on oh, somewhere. Uh, you toggle line numbers. There we go. See. Line numbers on the editors um, and so on. Um, oh, this would yeah. be great for blog. this would be great for blog posts. Yes, um, I I broke my blog. It's about the same time that I broke Posh Code. The um, I have a static blog set up, and I um, haven't been able to bother myself to fix it. Um, or to I mean, what I what I'm trying to say really is, I am going to blog about this when I when it's. When I've published the working uh, installer. One of the problems that I have right now, um, there's actually an, an issue open on the PowerShell repo. So um, I'm hosting PowerShell. I mean, this is actually a, a full blown PowerShell host written in C sharp. And um, the problem with that is that I'm the only person who's ever written such a thing that isn't on the PowerShell team. Um, and the in PowerShell, I shouldn't say that because there are uh, in the PowerShell five era in the Windows PowerShell, lots of us did it, and it's easy because you just say, 
I depend on Windows PowerShell. Well, Windows PowerShell is already on the box, so done. Everything works. Um, with the new PowerShell Core, you don't even know where PowerShell Core is if it's on the box. Um, so you can't use the on-the-box PowerShell, which means that the build process is very, very complicated. And when you're done, you have to actually ship the whole PowerShell, um, like everything. Um, in fact, if you look um, in the uh, in this file, you, um, Docker file. So you, this is the Docker file that builds it. And what you'll see is at the bottom when I'm doing the build on, um, I'm install. I'm running. I'm installing PowerShell. I'm running the build. Then in the output image that I create, um, I'm copying from the builder um, my output. Um, but the build script, the build script actually copies. One, um, the build script actually copies for each. So you see here is Windows, Linux, and OS X. For each one, it actually has to copy um, not just the output of the build, which is this line, but it actually has to do a get child item for PS Home and copy the the whole PS Home directory over the top because they have some modules, some built-in like Windows. Uh, the the Microsoft.powershell.core module, for instance, um, that stuff has PSD1 files and so on that are not part of the SDK. And when I first created this, I didn't have this line 32. And you saw how like sort wasn't a command. Well, I was getting like get command is not a command. And I would go, what the heck? And I'm like, I go to a different window and I do what what modules get command in, right? I do okay, import module Microsoft.powershell.utilities. And it would say import module is not a command. <laughs> I'm like, what? And the reason was those those core modules that ship with PowerShell weren't registered because they weren't actually on the box. Um so they don't ship it in the SDK. So right now I'm literally copying them out of the installed PowerShell. And it's not clear what the license would be for that. Um, and if you ever looked at the license file that ships with PowerShell, it's like a long list of licenses for all the different components that they include. And some of those are non-free, meaning like um, .NET, um, the old .NET 4 stuff, um, which is not an open source. There, there's DLLs in there that are .NET DLLs that are not open source yet that they're shipping in their uh, binaries. I mean, they're, you know, in their... actually, they're shipping them in the SDK, come to think of it. Um, so I don't know what the license is. What I need to say to make the lawyers leave me alone. Does that make sense? Um, so right now, it's just, here you go. You can build it yourself. Um, I need to figure out from the PowerShell team what the license, what I need to say in the license to basically just say, um, this has the same license as the PowerShell thing. Well, I don't care what it is. Um, there's a part of me that would really love to put just this, the PowerShell kernel.exe. Um, it's actually a DLL with a XE wrapper. Um, I'd love to just put that in and contribute it back to the PowerShell team and say, okay, I'll continue developing it, but I want you guys to just ship it in your stuff so I don't have to mess with licenses and um, all the rest of that craziness. But... Um, I think that's a little far afield for the core PowerShell to ship. And so I'm not holding out any, not even in conversations about that. It's just sort of like a picture. Any other questions? Well, you said this is loading a Docker binder, loading a Docker from your GitHub. Is it also, yeah. is, this, is this file in the GitHub now and you're editing it in place or is it currently? It is not. No, um, it's on the, this file is actually on the um, Docker. Docker image. 
Yeah. Now you can, there are ways around that, but there are not ways around that that you would want to take advantage of on somebody else's hosted Docker image. <laughs> um, so if you look actually at the Docker file that I was showing a minute ago, um, this is what's called a multi-stage Docker file. Mm -hmm. So you see it does from .NET SDK stretch image as builder. So this creates one Docker image. It's using the .NET SDK Docker container. Um, and it's, which is by the way, a Debian, uh, stretch, right. Um, then I'm doing some, some PowerShell stuff to install PowerShell. Now to install PowerShell, you first have to get, um, your locale configured correctly. So that's what all this stuff is. Um, then I'm doing, uh, this, this stuff you'll be familiar with if you've ever installed PowerShell on a. Uh, Linux box, but it's adding the Microsoft uh, apt get repo um, and then doing the apt get install for PowerShell. Um, then I'm copying, you see this right here, because this Docker file runs in the source of the repo, I'm copying the source folder out of my repo and into the Docker image. And I just run build um, uh, with, I, I mean, I copy, sorry, I copy build and then I run build. So you see I'm copying the build script into the root um, and just running it. Um, dash platform Linux because I don't want to try to run, I don't want to try to build the Windows and Mac images on Linux. And though that actually compiles it all. And then you see a, there's a new from. So this starts a new Docker image from the Jupyter-based notebook image, which is like their... Um, base Jupyter install with no kernels. Um, and I called it as run because this is going to be the container that actually runs at the end of all this. Um, and literally all this one does. Um, well, okay. It's, it's does that same thing to get the um, uh, locale stuff installed. Um, luckily the Jupyter base image already has locale set up so all i have to do is install the um the libraries libcurl lib on one uh that um that powershell needs to run um so those are the powershell dependencies and then i'm just copying output from builder so that's the other docker image from the other docker image copy the, the output folder into you know here um and then finally, there's some tricks. So this line is supposed to be copying the whole repo into home, but you see it's just doing star pi and star uh, ipi notebook. These are the uh, Jupyter notebook format and then markdown. So it's just copying all of the notebook and markdown format files into the Docker container. So that's why if you go back, if I go back to here, um, you see there's not very much in here. The source code's missing. I, all I did was copy the notebooks and markdown. Because I, like you said, if it was live, that'd be cool. But it's not live, so there's no point in copying everything else over. I'm not going to do any work here and, like, edit and anything like that. Um, although, hypothetically, right, I could, if I, if I copied the whole source over, then this would be a working Git repo. And I could just do a git commit from here against GitHub and push to GitHub. Um, that would be the only way that I would get the, the modified file back up to GitHub. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, on my binder. Um, this file, as I've edited it, is going to get lost at some point because eventually, you know, as long as I'm using it regularly, they keep the the image live and and the changes stay put that's why there's this like uh token thing on the end um but as soon as it expires they blow everything away um and you lose all the changes you made um so it's really just meant for demos um like i mean obviously the i can't export this right so i can download this as a notebook um if i want to just make a copy of it or you know dump it um 
I think that I mentioned, <laughs> I think the image that I started with probably doesn't have the rest on LaTeX and PDF uh, capability. So I can probably dump a, an HTML file, maybe. Um, So that's an HTML file. So this looks like a, a notebook, but you see when I double click, it's not editable. Um, so this is just like a static point in time version. Um, but it's still a really neat way of being able to dump. I mean, like I've been looking at this stuff, all of these exports, by the way, I should have mentioned that before. Um, all of these exports that are possible here, where like you dump to HTML or dump to PDF, these can all be scripted from the command line. So it is actually possible. And, and the other thing that's possible from the command line is this command here, run all. So you can actually call Jupyter and have it reevaluate all the cells and then have it export a PDF or an HTML file. So if you had like, if I was using this to generate graphs and tables and stuff, um, like I've got some tables here, but nothing you know significant but if i was using this to generate grass and tables i could in theory script refreshing the data and dumping a pdf and send it as an email as my report you know like my daily um or or hourly or whatever status you know that kind of stuff um i haven't done any of that um mostly because my job responsibilities don't include any of that um i don't have any reports to generate so um, I'm not looking for this, but um, I am talking, by the way. Have you guys seen the uh, PowerShell Universal Dashboard? Um, if you haven't seen it, I'll show you the PowerShell. Um, well, I thought that I had a tab open to it, but here we go. So this is by Adam, the guy that wrote the Posh tools for Visual Studio. Um, and, it, and, and it gives you a um, it gives you a way to generate you know these kinds of charts that refresh on a timer. Um, and I am working with him. Um, I'm hoping that we can ship, Obviously not the same thing because I don't actually want, I mean, in Jupyter, you don't want this like auto refreshing thing. It's not really a dashboard, but I'd like to have all the same widgets available so that you can generate graphs and stuff without having to learn two different sets of commands. Um, and I think that we have a, in principle, we have an agreement um, on how to do that um, so that we share. The widgets are all, um based on uh what do you call it on a on, a, on open source um chart okay anyway. um, but i'd like the i'd like to use the same commands anything else this thing by the way is very cool and if you've got any open source projects it is free for open source projects to use um so if you Anything where you want to like throw up a um, throw up a dashboard on uh, GitHub or whatever to monitor your stuff. Like this is an example of one. Um, they're very pretty and they are easy to work with. I'm trying to remember, I don't think he has a edit here but yeah you see all the different things um i i had um I, I i meant to mention this tool as part of so when we were talking earlier about um alternate tools um whoops the one of the ones that i mentioned is apache zeppelin so apache zeppelin is like jupiter labs um, but they are focused on, um, well, quite frankly, they're focused on creating things that look a lot like this. Um, 
widgets with charts in them um so that you can do data visualization because that's what their their core um, customer base is um so they are doing a lot of stuff kind of like this uh, it's not really the notebook kind of tool um but it's it's a, it's in a similar vein right um anyway anything else random questions <laughs> have any snow do we have any snow no snow left here oh. thankfully finally <laughs> although i i am i am sort of watching the weather because it is oh, it is in the neighborhood it's 40 here right now so it's Possible that it could have had um, speedies, Spideys? This wave, this huh? weekend are what's that? Is it a heat wave there? <laughs> no, it's April. I don't know why it's so cold, honestly. But like this weekend, our low is going to be. Uh, 24 and so it could very easily we actually have i'm looking at at wonderground weather underground they have sunday monday tuesday wednesday of next week is snow 50 50 percent chance every day so we're almost guaranteed to get snow at some point next week even though it is april i, I was saying to the kids it's really weird because we're driving home from church on easter morning and everything is like dead and i'm going i don't it's i mean easter is early this year but still feels like we should have flowers out and uh yeah no we're gonna have more blue on up here the kids Texas. reminded me the saying is april showers bring may flowers not april flowers we have blue Bonnets here in Texas. What's that? There's blue bonnets out here in Texas. Yeah. Well, you know, I got crocuses and 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 all those. Um, what's the other ones? All those early spring flowers are trying to come up, and they should be coming up, but they're getting killed by frost oh, yeah. and snow. So. Yeah. Um, hey, Joel. Yeah. Was there any plans for you to do anything with uh, Doug Finke's stuff as far as his charting and stuff with Import Excel? No. Okay. I um, you'll be able to. I mean, anything, any of that stuff, you'll be able to use in here, uh, assuming it's on the, assuming it's on the box, um, where you're hosting it. So, like for instance, it won't work for me because I'm never going to run this anywhere where Excel is installed. Um, oh yeah, his his module, the premises, you don't have to install Excel. So. Oh, is it? Yeah, he uses he uses the open source. Um, oh Excel. yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. So yeah, um, all of that stuff will work. I mean, you can install module. Like I can on this box over here. Um, we can do a. Uh, Can't remember what the name of it is. Import Excel. Oh, I put the star on the wrong end, didn't I? Yeah. What is? Are we still live? Oh, there we go. Oh, there's three Excel modules, but that's not okay. So, uh, oh, so this is this is where. Um, by the way, this is literally what I do when I am debugging something and I realize I just typed completely the wrong command. I don't move on and add another cell. I edit it <laughs> because there's no point in saving that, right? Like, no. So there you go. So now I would um, I would add a new, a new cell and I would do install module. Uh, 
Ooh. Oh. Oh, current. Shouldn't that have output? I would think so. Verbose. Hmm. Well, yeah. So, what happened? Blow it up. Well, that's just disappointing, isn't it? Um, part of the reason I asked I is he actually, was, I have what's right? that? Part of the reason I asked is he was I have no interested idea. in that shit, yeah. And he had signed up for I it, but no I have no idea didn't. why that's not working. By the way, this is my pet peeve in working with Jupiter. So when this happens, right, it's like, oh, um, get help, save module. Of course, the help files aren't installed, but I'm not going to get those installed because I don't have, because I'm running a Docker container where I'm not. Um, path. See what idiot made that path instead of destination. <laughs> There's a couple of them. If you don't specify a path, it blows up. Period. Well, I just feel like um, you know, copy, move. They all use destination as where it goes out. But so clearly. Um, <coughs> Actually, let's just do this. Oops, shoot. Oh. <clears throat> Lots disappointing. Okay, that's a new pet peeve right there. There we go. I don't know. What do you want to do in Excel? Import Excel. I don't know anything. Um, but yes, see, I can install modules. It took a little doing. But I, I, have to, I have to look into why I can't install it. Scope user. That's kind of weird. I bet you the. Um, I bet you the user, the folder where the user is supposed to go, is not right. Uh, is not writable. I noticed. You see here. I had to do this. Shown to change the um, mm -hmm. and Chamod just to make these things writable by the user. Um, yep. And I bet you that whatever that thing is that it's wherever it's trying to put it, I didn't. I need to chone that. Um, I don't. I don't know. Off the top of my head. Well, it'll give you a PS module. Don't do enough. Pardon? Do a PS module, uh, shouldn't it? I believe it would be yes. That or that Jovian modules. But the see, the thing is, the weird thing is that 
Yeah, Jovian is the user. This is the one that I added just now. And you see I got the slash backwards because I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I really need to learn to use join path so that that doesn't happen. I have to say, I, it doesn't matter because the interesting thing is, although this is not a valid Linux path, in PowerShell, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I know exactly what you mean. But, uh, yeah, I think, um, well, obviously, one of these is not writable, and the other one should be. So this one's, this is the machine, mod, uh, you know, local machine, and this is the current user. So the dot .local, whatever that is, it is probably not writable by my user. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, well, it doesn't matter much um, because you can always just do what I did here and add a path. But I, I could actually fix that in the in the Docker image. That would be useful. Um, so then, do you have a write up for if I want to put up my own to be able to produce these as I'm writing code? Um, the um, there is a README. Um, there is not. I do not have a great explanation yet because right now I just sort of go, well, you need to install Jupyter. So go read their docs. And then um, what I have is um, a chocolatey package. To, and the chocolatey package has an installer. But the chocolatey package is still marked pre-release because, like I said before, I'm still trying to figure out what the license has to be. Um but the chocolatey installer, so if you look in the source code for this thing, um, there is a right? Um, and this thing, um, it does like, am I on Windows? Am I on Linux? Am I on Mac? And it puts the things in the right place. And it generates the kernel file that is needed to register powershell with jupiter once jupiter is ready um so like on a windows box if you were to download the source code and run the build script you'd be able to run the chocolatey install from the folder where it's copied into the build um and then you would need to install like let's say anaconda um anaconda is a python distro and it and they um, they are focused on numeric stuff, so they actually include um, Jupyter in the install, the base install. So you don't have to look. You don't have to do the pip install Jupyter to get Jupyter installed later. Um, so most of that information is in the README on the. But I mean, the one that you, please the one that you feel free. To... Pardon? There's yeah, the, the, the J. Cole's. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Jekyll slash uh, Jupiter. Um, so, yeah. In here, there's a readme, which has the, like, what you need to do is, now I noticed earlier that there's some, this readme is not the latest version, and I went on my laptop here and I don't have the version. I edited this and added a link to Binder to it so that you could click and open it in Binder and see play with it. Um, and the link is not there. So I need to find a version. Um, by the way, one of the cool things about Jupyter is GitHub renders them. So if you open one of these IPython notebooks, GitHub will actually process it and render it. But it doesn't you can't run it here, but the full um the full code is you know working displaying and whatever. And it's so um, then it's actually it's, it's actually there. executed at once then is that the deal? No, no, they do not execute it, they just pull up the out because when you make a Jupyter uh a Jupyter notebook stores the output. So they're just showing you the output that was pre-stored. They don't run it. They don't want to let people do that. Um, 
but they will render your your things and 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 incidentally the other thing that you'll see is like um if we go back to that readme one um they have some issues um so if you look at the readme uh So where's the thing? So that you see the tables are formatted differently than they are. And this one got screwed up completely. Um, and it's just because they are, their rendering isn't quite the same as Jupiter's so the table on in Jupiter. This renders as a series. Well, it renders as a table, um, but because they're not actually um, using the right Jupiter command, I don't know. It's just wrong. Um, and like this right here, this is supposed to be a, uh, you see out here, we have a graphic. See this QR code for happy birthday. Um, and yeah, the, uh, whoops. Where did it go? Yeah. So they're not rendering it at all. Don't know why. Um, but anyway, so they, there are some issues with certain features. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's really neat. Um, now, the other thing is you cannot, I tried, you cannot just have a README iPy. Um, they require the, the markdown document. So I have this markdown, and then I've got like, okay, over here, if you want to see the examples, click here, and you can see them. Um, but yeah. I do have some updates to this readme is what I was getting at. Um, but the, the chocolatey package that's out there does work. And unlike, so the current version, the current source is PowerShell core only. The version that's on chocolatey is PowerShell core and PowerShell full. It does both. So you get Windows, PowerShell, and PowerShell core. Um, on Windows, on Linux and OS X, you just get core. Um, but like I said, the the PowerShell core stuff wasn't actually working on Linux and OS X. Um, so it is working now. Do feel free if um, if you have issues, you know, file one, um, and we'll get things fixed up. Um, yeah. Questions or anything like that, feel free to use that as a way to get answers after today. Woo. Now I have tags. All right. Anything else? No questions in the room. All right. I don't think we have any. Yeah. Okay. Wow, Joel, this was pretty. Uh, I found it very interesting. I can understand why you think it's cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm excited about it. I wanna. I, I want the graphing and stuff working to to really like, you know, give a demo some pop. But um, it's one of those things where I don't need it for my work. I don't care about graphs. Um. But I can see how it's obviously um, eye candy. But also, the interesting thing, of course, most of the Jupyter users are not DevOps people. Most of the Jupyter users are math people. Um, so when you go and look, when you go Googling Jupyter stuff, the people that are using it are doing R and, and MATLAB and Julia and languages like that for data analytics and so on um, so they've got all kinds of graphs and this kind of stuff uh very important to them i just don't care because i'm not doing math in powershell i'm doing devops deploying stuff i just did you know, log. Uh. <laughs> well i think it would be good for um people that have to hand off their code to somebody else and they don't actually execute it actually yeah, help them i had it. i've had a couple cases yeah yeah exactly i've had a couple cases recently where um we had deployment scripts 
where um you know you, you it's gotten into this unmaintainable level where there's so many error handling stuff in it because every time there's an error we just add that to the error handling um and the reality is we don't actually need that stuff now because all our environments are fixed and those errors don't occur anymore but the but we're too scared to take them out completely right um and so i i kind of uh like the idea of being able to give somebody a document that sort of says well this is the the powershell you need to run but um if it goes wrong if you see this then you need to run this if you see this then you need to run this, right um, and um give give some like troubleshooting steps um like my my current pet peeve at work was we had something went wrong on a deployment um and i literally had people going i don't know who like the error appears to be in our code but we're calling those guys code to get the results and they're not giving us the results back so it's their fault but they didn't know who they was like they literally didn't know which other team at the company owned the code that they were calling so first of all oh my gosh failure to communicate um but my boss my boss has been at the company 20 years or so so he's the guy that always gets called he was out of town for two days so they're calling me and asking me to help them and i don't know i'm new here i'm like you guys you know you it's your code figure it out right um but it really made me wish that i could get my boss doing this because the troubleshooting that he is going to go through when he gets back um i would like to know what it was <laughs> um and and i would like in the future when something like this happens i'd like to give those documents that you can say Follow this. Do this. I don't know. All right. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Um, thank you very much, Joel. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks for all that You're you welcome. do, actually, for the community as well. That's much appreciated as well. I appreciate all the times that you've helped me on Slack and you helped me with the channel that we have there that doesn't get used very often, but when we need it, it's <laughs> I appreciate it. You're welcome. Anybody else have anything for Joel in the room? Thanks for your time, Joel. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome, guys. Now, uh, Joel, we will have um, next month, and everybody in the room will have um, Doug Finke uh, presenting his module. Uh, Import Excel. That was the other reason for the question because he actually expressed some interest in attending tonight, and I looked for him, but I didn't see him online yet. Yeah, yeah. I got. Um, I don't. I haven't used that. I haven't done like back when I first started test automation. We actually had a data generator that we wrote as Excel macros, um, and when I finally was able to drop that, I like never looked back i don't do excel at all i just <laughs> um my current I, gig I, you know managing a bunch of hardware assets in a spreadsheet that we're using to yeah, import yeah. in puppet yaml files and that kind of thing right. so um it the import excel came in very very handy for that particular purpose oh, yeah no it's it's obviously really useful um if you if you have data in those and you need to do or or you need to update or or whatever um that it's a very very nice way i certainly rather do that than write the <laughs> write the vba macros again that was no fun <laughs> at all yeah i hear you there <laughs> all right talk all right. to you later all right thanks so much have a good night. You're welcome. You too. Bye. All right. Hey, guys. Um, hopefully you heard what I indicated that we're going to have uh, Doug Finke next week. Or, ne excuse me, next month.
And I should be back on site next month. Look forward to it. See you soon. Yep. And hopefully it won't be too hot when I ride back. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Are you riding back on your bike? Yeah, we rode all the way here. We rode to uh, Texas. So all we have is motorcycles. That's why I was concerned about the weather. I had to make sure I went outside and covered them all. It's not too hot yet. It's nice so far. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to hang up, you guys. Um, thanks. Thanks again, Oliver. Appreciate all your hard work. No problem. Anytime.